Hey guys, welcome to another segment of Chasing the Mic. I'm your host, Jimmy Zane, and we're here live at Chappie's Bar and Grill, located in wonderful Arbutus, Maryland, right here on Washington Boulevard. And tonight we're talking with Victor Mosco. He's from Baltimore, and he's a musician. How are you doing? Great. I'm doing great. Wonderful. Good to meet you. <laughs> so tell me, man, what got you into this? Music? Oh, geez, I was dragging around at three years old. I was dragging around a get- uh, plastic guitar instead of a teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> My uncle played, and I always thought it was fascinating. So I just, you know, I, I took up guitar. What's your What's your favorite kind of music to play? All of it, from Bach to bluegrass. I don't care. Oh, there you go. <laughs> wow, man, I like that. From Bach to bluegrass. <laughs> so, uh, do you? <laughs> he's making faces at you. He's going to get you, man. He, he can't break me down. <laughs> <laughs> so, how long have you been playing? Oh, geez. Like uh, actually, actually, sixty. Been out there playing. <sighs> 60 some years. Wow. Wow. Who's some of your biggest influences that actually got you into wanting to play out? Um, a guy named Monty Polson was my uh, my big hero. Monty was a bass player, stand up bass player. He played with Ethel Ennis and Billy Holiday. Oh, wow. When I was a kid, my sister used to take me up to Pratt Street. There was a bar up on Pratt Street, and when the band took a break, Monty didn't smoke or drink. So you come out and, he, and, and sit me on a curb with my sister sitting alongside of me, a little kid, and he would teach me music. And he, beautiful guy. What a From great that day on, man, you're like, let's do this. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I stayed with it uh, ever since, and you know, God, I've played music all through the uh, f- late fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties. So being old school, I'm old school too. I, you know, I'm, I'm still a firm believer in vinyl records, all this stuff. When you hear the music that they call music today, and what the kids listen to, it's rhythmics. What is it? What is? It's rhythmics. But how would you compare it now? For instance, me growing up, my parents didn't like the heavy, hard rock '80s, '90s rock that I listened to. It's okay. Yeah. And then it's funny because like some of the stuff my kids listen to I don't really care for. Even though I'm a musician myself and I DJ, but some of the stuff they call music today, I I just it just seems like there's no real talent in it. Well hip hop and, and you know all that stuff that goes with today's music, uh thrash and stuff, it, it's for a certain group. And I understand that, you know, that's what they like and that's okay. It's music. Right. But you know, I have a kid sit there and tell me this is a power chord. Well, a power chord, <laughs> you know, if you know music, right. it's a first, a third, and a fifth of the scale. That's a triad chord. Two strings, you're not in a chord at all. Right. <laughs> see, I just like, for instance, I, you know, prime example, I see these, you know, I've, I've been playing drums since I was five. And some of these drummers out there today, you know, they're all about this fast thrash metal, which is fine. Anybody can play fast. But, you know, you, you, you try to compare that to some of the great drummers Anywhere from you know Buddy Rich and Max Roach and and uh, Neil Peart, and it's sad that he's no longer playing. As today, uh, you know, if anybody's heard the news that you know due to uh, really bad arthritis, Neil Peart is no longer going to be playing, and that's sad because he's such a phenomenal drummer. But hearing the drummers that they call drummers today, and actually looking back on percussionists then, to me there's no comparison. Well, the last of the old new old time drummers was. Steve Gadd, probably out right, of New right, York. Steve Gadd, right. And Steve Gadd was a studio type guy. Yes. He, he didn't travel much. He, he charged you a set fee to do a record with you. And he was a devoted guy, like his kids, like yeah. to go home to his wife and family. Well, I tell you, it's funny because a lot of anybody who's a musician know who Steve, anybody who's in the music know who Steve Gadd is. And it's funny, he didn't do much travel. He was a studio kind of guy, but his name's on a lot of record, a lot of Absolutely. albums out there. You know? Absolutely. Uh, do you think. Uh, do you think that the kids are, are, are learning uh, how to play instruments today from the old school? Because I, I, I see a lot of kids today that are younger who are playing guitars and stuff like that, reverting back to blues and jazz and stuff like that. That's when they start to get good. And classical, right. That's how you learn, right. <laughs> yeah, that's... I mean, that's how I started out, playing jazz. I mean, you know, in a big band era, you know, watching my grandfather play the big band era type music. And I was so overwhelmed, man, with some of the stuff that these people could do with a pair of sticks and hands. And that's what got, got, got me into it. As far as musicians go, what were some of your biggest influences that you can remember that really stuck in your mind? Oh, God. <laughs> the Rat Pack. Ah, <laughs> Sinatra, the Rat Pack. Which was, Sinatra, uh, Sinatra uh, Sammy Davis uh, Sammy Jr., Davis and, um, uh, Dean Martin. Yeah, Dean Martin. Oh, Jesus, you know. And there was one more. Well, there was four of them. 
Uh, uh, Peter Lover, it was, uh, Joey Bishop, they all, right, they all Joey, hung out right, together. Right, right, right. right. But there singer. was only three singers out of that group. Right. And they were phenomenal singers. Uh, you, you could tell uh, by the time they got to their older years, uh, what was happening is they had to alter their singing right. voice in order to, to, to be able to, to do a song. And, you know, like I, I'll do a song that somebody else does, but I go to the highest note in the song that's hit, and that's where I find everything for me, the highest note that I can hit. Right. And then I backtrack it down and I transpose. Right, right. That was easier for to play, <laughs> you know? Well, it's easier for me to sing. Right, easier for to sing, right. So if, uh, do you think uh, a lot of musicians I talked to last week kind of agree that Baltimore, as far as the music scene go, it's a dying scene. It's how would you feel about that? I mean, there's not any venues like there used to be. Think been, about it. Vic. I've been all over Europe, and I'm going to tell you right now: when you tell them you're from Baltimore, Maryland, what they know about Baltimore is Johns Hopkins Hospital, right, and University, and Peabody Institute. Yes, Peabody. It's very well known. Oh yes, of very course. Well respected. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, my mom went to Peabody. As a matter of oh, fact, they yeah. did an album in the '60s. You know, with the whole chorus thing and. Yes, the Peabody's very well respected, but I just think as far as venues go, there's really nothing like there used to be. I mean, like, you know, you used to have the blues, uh, the, what was it, the Black Cat Club for jazz and stuff. That's not even there anymore. Nobody's, nobody's... Oh, you're too young to remember. There used to be an after-hours place down on North Avenue, and that was called the Birdcage. <laughs> Mickey Fields ran it, and Warren Gant was uh, a drummer. Uh, geez, uh, Monty Polson was a bass player. And there were musicians that played in the evening, and after two o'clock, they all gathered down in that, at the birdcage. Wow. And man, you want to hear some music. Brother, they were out the door good. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's, it's sad that they don't have anything like that today. I mean, if they did, you have to worry about so much crime in, in the area. It's like you're afraid to even step out your door at a certain time. And I would like to see Baltimore come back up uh, with as far as the music scene goes and, and get some of the old school back in there. But... Sometimes I feel like uh, the way things are going today, it's just it's not going to happen. Well, you can mix the old and the new. I do a lot of stuff that's older stuff. Uh, you know, the guy that's filming this right now can tell you I'll do some uh, Cab Calloway. And it's, oh, who's Cab Calloway? Cab Calloway was a Baltimore boy that if you watch the Blues Brothers movie, yes. he was a janitor <laughs> in the movie. And at the end of the movie... He was out there in a gray, you know, gray tuxedo with tails, leading his orchestra, and that was Cab Calloway Orchestra. Wow! And they were phenomenal. It's uh, funny because it, there is so many musicians uh, that have been in like movies that are actually from Baltimore. And uh, I think uh, what's the guy named John um, who does uh, the hairspray movies? What was his name, John? Um, uh, uh, no, no, uh, the guy who uh, makes movies, Derek. You know what I'm talking about, John. Oh, John Waters. Yeah, John Waters. John Waters, yeah. John Waters would put a lot of Baltimore people in his movies, and he would have a lot of these old jazz guys from Baltimore in some of the movies, and it was really cool. And if you only if you really knew music, you'd know who they are. But it's it's crazy, man. It's 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 funny to think Baltimore at one time was really big in the music scene. Oh yeah, you go down to the old uh, Lord Baltimore Hotel, the Congress Hotel, the Marble Bar. Yeah. You could see Paul Whiteman. Paul Whiteman was a Maryland boy. Right, right. You know, people, well, who's Paul Whiteman? He's a big orchestra leader. Right. That, you know, that I guess you could consider him along with, uh, you know, the bubble machine type guy. <laughs> but that was a hell of a band that he had. He, he had uh, nothing but the best with him. What was some of the musicians that you saw live that you thought were really well live just as well as they were recorded? Um, most respected and, and well loved. You, probably guys you won't know. <laughs> uh, Taj Mahal, if you ever saw The Color Purple. The movie? Yeah. yeah. Taj Mahal did all the music from that. <laughs> He's about a six foot five black guy. The last <laughs> guy you would think is a musician. Right. <laughs> but what a hell of a guy. And um, Ry Cooter, he did all the uh, sound for uh, The Long Riders with Emilio Estevez. Yes, 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 and those yes. guys. And probably one of the best bottleneck slide guitarists oh, in the country. Wow. Yeah, I tell you, Jeff Jeff Healy was good. Do you remember Jeff Healy? Oh, yeah. He was good, and may he rest in peace. But, hey, man, Vic, thanks a lot for talking to us. This is the godfather of Ruben Mike Vic here. I'm Jimmy Zane. We'll be talking to you in a little bit. Thank you.